Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. Until you get that second dose, you're not fully protected. And if you don't receive the recommended second dose of either the Pfizer or Moderna COVID vaccines, your immunity may wear off sooner and leave you vulnerable to new variants. There's already some level of decreased protection due to these variants and newer variants are on the way because of people not being vaccinated. So the sooner you get two doses, the sooner you're protected. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on Monday, April the 26th, 2021. Well, it certainly is difficult to keep up on the ever-changing news about vaccines and about COVID itself, but we are doing our best to keep you updated. Here today again is Dr. Greg Poland, virologist and vaccine and infectious disease expert at Mayo Clinic. Hi, Greg. Good morning. How are you today? Happy Monday. Good to see you. Yes, happy Monday. Now, Greg, we decided to wear our black leather today because we're getting tough on COVID. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> we actually were chatting and found out we both had a black leather jacket so we thought well goodness sakes we ought to get we ought to get those on the air you know it uh, symbolizes to me if you ride a motorcycle you put on leather to protect your body from any kind of injury well covid vaccines are like that they're a protection against bodily injury. So it makes sense. I like that. And I thought it might just be because you were in the witness protection program there. (laughs) Again? (laughs) (laughs) We can tell you've changed location today. Yes. There was too much noise where I normally sit. So we tried this. All right. Well, Greg, let's jump right in. I want to ask you first about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The vaccine advisory panel met Friday, if I am not mistaken. What's the latest? Yeah, I attended all six hours of that, and basically it came down to uh, understanding, did we have the data so that we truly understood the risk? Have we had time to educate women, the public, and have we had time to educate physicians about this peculiar syndrome? The answer to all three of those was reasonably yes. And so they voted to reinstate, now it was 10-4, Uh, it, five against and one abstention, or four against and one abstention. So uh, by virtue of that vote then on on that day, CDC said you can go ahead now and uh, and immunize with with the proviso that we want to continue educating and make women aware of the risks and the benefits. I just want to say, Greg, thanks for sitting through six hours of that. It sounds a little like watching paint dry to me, but I'm sure it's fascinating to a vaccine expert. Indeed. <laughs> well, our next vaccine question, where are we with emergency use authorization for teenagers, say ages 12 to 15? Yeah, uh, Helene, that's a great question. Actually, the 9th of April, Pfizer uh, submitted their EUA request to the FDA for individuals 11, uh, sorry, 12 to 15 years of age. And now what they're doing is they're marching down by age ban and plan to go all the way to six months. The oh, wow. reason for that, and that, that catches a lot of people by surprise. The reason for that is if we look back a year, we would say probably not necessary. Kids were not getting sick at the rate that other people were. And if they had infection, it was basically asymptomatic. That is no longer true with these new variants. In effect, we're seeing a different disease and a different disease process. So now it does become necessary to protect children. Moderna is also uh, doing those studies. So I expect and I hope before fall time, before school, that, that those EUAs, they'll certainly be granted before then, but I'm hoping the supply is such that children will be able to get immunized before going to school so that they can safely go to school and live the lives children should, by all rights, be living. Greg, we have noted that not only are people at times lacking confidence in the vaccine, but some people are not getting their second dose now. Mm. How important is it to get the second dose of the vaccine? And why are some choosing not to? This is is really important. 
about 8% uh, of people who got their first dose have not yet returned for their second dose and yet should have. This is concerning when you're getting close to one in 10, misthinking that I don't need a second dose or that the risks are too high of a second dose. Neither of those would be true. It is really important. It's true that when you measure in the short term, one dose in a healthy person offers about 80% protection, but that's not 95% or 100% protection like you get after two doses. The other thing is we would expect immunity after one dose to wear off much more quickly than after two doses. And this is really important. You know, we've been able to verify about 21,000 people who have documented infection after getting just one dose, but not both doses. And that has a lot of implications. It has implications for continuing infection, continuing development of new variants, and of course, for those individual people's health and well being. So, Greg, have the recommendations on the length of time between the two vaccines changed at all since you and I talked about it months ago? It really has not. What has changed is research being carried out in the US and the UK and other places looking at changing the interval and mixing and matching different types of vaccines. Yes, Those, can you do that? Yeah, well, those studies are still in progress. I expect that we reasonably will able, be able to do both. The tension here is if you got one mRNA, could you get a different mRNA vaccine? I'm expecting the answer to that's gonna be yes. The question is if you get an mRNA and then an adenovirus vectored vaccine, is that the same as getting two boats of either one of the vaccine? We don't know yet. In terms of interval, I will be shocked if we don't find out that you can expand that interval. The question is at this point, is there any reason to do that? And I would say no. And the reason that I would say that is until you get that second dose, as we just talked about, you're not fully protected. There's already some level of decreased protection due to these variants and newer variants are on the way because of people not being vaccinated. So the sooner you get two doses, the sooner you're protected. Okay, sage advice, get your second yeah. dose. Indeed. And your first dose if you haven't yet. That's right. <laughs> Greg, there's just been tragic uh, news coming out of India and the issues there with COVID. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what is causing that dramatic rise? Yeah, uh, well, this is something I paid a lot of attention to because what tends to happen in other areas tends to be a risk factor for happening in our own country. Uh, India is a little different of a situation, but think of it this way. Think of all of the difficulties we've had here in the most developed and educated nation in the history of the world. Now transport that to nations that don't have the same level of economic and educational development that we have. Take a, a government in, in India that was warned just like we were with a first wave and thought we're through it. We don't have mm -hmm. to worry about it. That has certainly not been the case. In addition, they've had both because of elections and for religious holidays, they've had truly mass gatherings. That is like putting gasoline on the fire we call the pandemic. And then lastly, um, they are being subjected to variants just like we are. And in particular, it's, it's a terrible name for it. It's a misnomer but you'll hear the press calling it the double mute. Well, every, every variant virus has mutations. In this case, in the Indian strain, what, what's been called the B1617 variant, there are two critical mutations along with 11 other mutations. So this is what happens when people don't wear a mask and don't get vaccinated. That virus will just continue to transmit and multiply and gain new mutations. 
making it more difficult to protect all of us. Um, and so they've experienced that. And two of the mutations in that Indian variant are particularly critical mutations. So we will see that variant here in the US as we have every variant. And, and I wanna make a, a, an important point here. We are now entering the most dangerous phase of the pandemic for people, for people that have not been immunized or who are not fully immunized. This is the most dangerous point compared to any time in the pandemic. And the reason for it is that we are now facing these highly transmissible variants that have viral loads four, five, six times higher than the variant that, that circulated a year ago. So this is really critical for nations and for people to get sort of fixed and straight in their mind so that they can take the appropriate steps and protect themselves, their families, and their communities. So the vaccine efforts need to go on. Absolutely, and, and, and expand. And we're doing really well. That's good news oh, good. Uh, in the US. We're doing really well with that. I mean, it's incredible how many people have gotten vaccinated. The other side of that coin is the people who are not confident, who are hesitant in vaccines. And it's really a shame because in their particular case, unless there's a medical contraindication like anaphylaxis, they're operating on fear about the vaccine mm. and diminishing the true risk of the disease. And as you and I as healthcare workers have seen, one tragic family story after yes. another where you know the conclusion is, I guess we didn't take this seriously, or this is what I hear over and over again. We didn't know it could lead to this. And so all we can do is plead with people, get good information. I hear people say all the time, well, I don't know what to believe. Here's a stress test on that. Go to any credible medical center website in the world, and you will find the same information, the same plea for people to get vaccinated. That's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Say, Greg, I want to get back to talking about, um, you talked about India a little bit, but we are aware there are other hot spots, including, uh, I think, Brazil, Japan, et cetera. Are they having their own um, mutations, such as what's been found in India? Yeah, they do tend to see more of them because of international travel and oftentimes okay. less restrictions, governments less prepared to deal with it. Uh, you know, again, you look at India, less than 0.01% of people have been vaccinated. So all we need to do when we say, what can the variant do to me? Look at India where people have not been vaccinated and you'll see. They're literally sending SOSs for oxygen. They have no more ICU beds. We're seeing the same thing happen in Michigan, in our own country. 38 states now are in, after 10, nine, 10 weeks of straight declines are now starting back up that surge line. So uh, the, these variants and the lack of masking and full immunization are responsible. There's nowhere else to lay the blame. All right, here's another question from a listener. We have a household of seven. In a few weeks, five of us will be fully vaccinated, but the other two are under the age of 16. What does that mean for our family? Can we operate as if we are a fully vaccinated household, or do we need to continue to operate as an unvaccinated household until the kids become eligible for the vaccine? That's a great question, and actually a really practical one that many, many families are facing. So there's a little bit of a nuance here. If everybody in that family is otherwise healthy, then they can get together and they can be indoors and they don't need to wear masks. If the individuals who are unprotected are immunocompromised, then everybody wears masks. If the five members that have been immunized, if there's somebody there who's immunocompromised, that person should wear a mask. 
So, so slightly different recommendations depending on the nuance of the situation. But if everybody's healthy, they can get together. Okay, that's great. Uh, any last words to share today? That's all the questions I have for you, Greg. Um, you know, I, I, I took some notes uh, because I wanted to be sure to uh, um, uh, mention a couple of things. Number one is the CDC did release a statement saying, okay, pregnant women get the vaccine. We've got enough oh, yes, data now. It's safe. We haven't seen any medical problems. Number two, as we talked about, the CDC reaffirmed the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. There is a slight risk predominantly to women below the age of about 50 years of age, more so below the age of 40, but that risk is outweighed by the risk of getting COVID. And um, I, I think, as you said, we're seeing the rise of additional variants, for example, in, in Brazil, in India, in New York, in California. The vaccines seem to protect against those, though with a slightly lesser efficacy. So this is, you know, I liken it to a fire burning. We wanna take steps now while the fire could be controlled by getting people immunized rather than wait to the disaster we saw in Michigan and India, Japan, and Brazil, and South Africa. All right, thank you. Go get your vaccine. Hands, face, space, and vaccinate as we That's always That's right, that's right. Thank you, Greg. My pleasure. Our thanks to Dr. Greg Poland for being here with us today to give us our COVID-19 and vaccine update. I hope that you learned something today. I know that I did, and we wish each of you a very wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.